Well, good evening. Amen. Welcome to Calvary Chapel, Quincy, California. Turn with me in your Bibles this evening to the Song of Solomon. Sometimes called the Song of Songs, but the Song of Solomon. We're starting this new book tonight. A new study through the Old Testament. Now, King Solomon wrote three books in the Old Testament. He wrote Proverbs. We went through that a few months ago. He wrote Ecclesiastes, which we just finished, and he wrote the Song of Solomon. And it's likely that Solomon wrote the book of Proverbs when he was in the very pinnacle of his life, at his best. We believe he wrote the book of Ecclesiastes in the later years of his life as he declined both spiritually and physically. And then we believe that he wrote this book before us tonight, the Song of Solomon, in his younger years. And without a doubt, apart from the book of Revelation, which we're studying on Sunday, the Song of Solomon is one of the most unique and unusual books in the Bible. At times, this book is going to make you laugh. You'll be laughing at the cultural references that Solomon uses. At times, it's going to make you consider your own relationship with Jesus Christ and His with you. If you're married... It'll teach you some wonderful lessons in relating to your spouse. And lastly, whether you're married or not, it will show you that character matters more than beauty. Character matters more than beauty. Amen, Amen to that. This is a book that can and should be taken literally as the story of love. The love between King Solomon and this Shulamite shepherd girl. That would be its, its obvious and natural reading and interpretation. However, we also see an illusion throughout the, this book, an illusion of the love between Jehovah and Israel. That illusion can also describe the love between Christ and his church. In fact, in the book of Ephesians, speaking about married, married relationships, roles, and, and love in marriage, Paul says, but I speak of Christ and the church. So marriage is a type of Christ and his church. The relationship in marriage should somehow mirror the relationship between Christ and his church. So at times we'll see this allusion to Jesus and his church. And lastly, that same allusion can describe the love between an individual believer and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now the problem, however, with illusions or allegories is that some individual has to decide what that means and what happens is that everybody comes up with a different interpretation and meaning well if the word of god doesn't mean what it plainly says it means then how do you know what it means at all so we're going to take the Song of Solomon in its obvious and natural reading, which is the story of love between King Solomon and a shepherd girl. So that's the interpretation. But along the way, we're going to make lots of application, you see, because it's applicable to our relationship with Jesus Christ. So although we will interpret it in its plain and natural sense, we will also apply it to our lives today and our relationship with Christ. Amen? Amen? Now, some people wonder why this book is in the Bible at all. Well, it's there because God purposed to put it there for us. It shows us that God, number one, is for marriage. And He's for the romantic love that goes on in marriage. And did you know in, in, in the whole of the Old Testament... There's never a mention of a bachelor. Did you know that? Bachelor's never mentioned in the whole of the Old Testament. Marriage was expected in Jewish society. It was expected that, that people would be married. Now, there were eunuchs mentioned, virgins, widows, widowers in the Old Testament. And the prophet Jeremiah was told specifically by God not to marry. But other than that, Marriage was expected in Jewish society throughout the Old Testament. 
So the theme, the theme of the Song of Solomon is the story of love. Or subtitled, which we're using on our screen and comes right out of Solomon itself, the Song of Solomon. His banner over me is love. Love between Solomon and the shepherd girl. Love between Jehovah, God, and Israel. And love between Christ and his church. And last of all, love between the individual believer and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is without a doubt the story of love. And as I mentioned, when it makes sense, we're going to draw some application for ourselves from the various aspects found in these different allusions. And there are many to be had throughout this book. Now the key verse is found in chapter 2, verse 4. It says, He brought me to the banqueting house, and his banner over me is love. Solomon brought the Shulamite shepherd girl to his home in the same way that Christ will one day bring us home. You see the illusion? And just like Solomon's love for the shepherd girl was a banner in the sky declaring his love, so too Christ loves us in this way, declaring openly his love for us by dying for us on the cross to pay for our sin in full in public. His body lifted up about, above the earth like a banner. Without a doubt, his banner over me is love. Amen? And his banner over you is love. Now, there are three main characters in this book that will speak back and forth to one another. There is the Shulamite, whom we suppose, we're not sure, but we suppose to be Abishag from 2 Kings chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. She was a beautiful young woman uh, of the city of Shunem in, in the Galilee region from the tribe of Issachar. She was selected by the servants of King David to, to minister uh, to him in his old age. She actually became his wife, but they never consummated the marriage. So they, we believe that the Shunammite woman is, is Abishag because she was from Shulem or Shunem, the city up there in the Galilee region. Now there is another person called the Beloved, and we recognize this person to be King Solomon. In fact, King Solomon is mentioned by name six different times in this book. There's also a group of, uh, of ladies who are called the Daughters of Jerusalem. And these appear to be ladies of the court, uh, ladies in waiting who serve the king. And in addition to these three main characters, we also find uh, the Shulamites' brothers are mentioned once, and there's an unnamed relative mentioned once as well. And you'll also notice that the back and forth uh, conversation between these characters does not necessarily follow the layout of the verses. Oftentimes the verses are split between one character speaking and another speaking. So we're going to follow the storyline as it moves from character to character rather than from verse to verse. So you have to follow closely in your Bible because we're going to follow the, the speaking of the characters versus, uh, versus the verses. Versus the verse. That didn't work, did it? <laughs> I needed another word for that. Now, the editors of your Bibles have probably broken uh, the text out in that way. If you look in your Bible, there's probably headings that'll say uh, the Shulamite or the Beloved or the Daughters of Jerusalem. If you look in your Bibles, most of them, the editors have probably got that right in there for you. So you know who, who is speaking throughout this book. And with that introduction, turn with me in your Bibles to the book of the Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 1. It says, the Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. In 1 Kings, chapter 4, verse 32, it says that King Solomon wrote 3,000 Proverbs and 105,000 songs. And among the songs of King Solomon... This was his best. You didn't know this was a song, did you? 
That's interesting, isn't it? This is a song. It's, it's poetry set to music. This was the song of songs. That's a superlative way of saying this was the best song of them all. And from this verse, we get the titles for this book. It's often called uh, either the Song of Songs or the Song of Solomon. And both of those titles are derived directly from verse 1. And this book, by the way, was part of the Jewish canon of Scripture. It was not only held and accepted as God's word by the Jewish people, but it was highly esteemed among the books of the Bible. One Jewish rabbi called this book the Holy of Holies of God's Word. The Jewish rabbis didn't even allow a Jewish man to read this book until he was in his 30s, lest he should read it with, with, in an impure way. So they, they esteemed this book highly. Jesus himself considered this book among the Holy Scriptures. And if it was good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for us. Amen? Amen. In fact, the very first recorded miracle of Jesus took place at a Jewish wedding where he changed water into wine. Marriage is sacred. And it should continue to be sacred among both Christians and Jews. The world has perverted marriage to be a union of anything and everything and anyone and everyone they could imagine. But in God's holy word, marriage is between one man and one woman and nothing else. Until death do us part. Amen? All right, let's look at verse 2. The Shulamite speaks. And she says, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. For your love is better than wine. Because of the fragrance of your good ointments, your name is ointment poured forth. Therefore the virgins love you. Draw me away. These verses describe the intimacy that should exist in the marriage relationship. She says, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. That's pretty intimate. In the book of Genesis, it says that the two shall become one flesh. At the very beginning, God intended marriage to be an intimate relationship between one man and one woman. In fact, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, the lack of intimacy in marriage is opportunity for Satan to tempt one or both into sin. Whenever I taught that passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, I titled that section, Keeping Your Marriage Alive. And the section that follows directly after it, I titled, Keeping Your Marriage Vows. That's what 1 Corinthians 7 is all about. Keeping your marriage alive and keeping your marriage vows. So we have this intimacy uh, conveyed through this passage at the very beginning. So what we see at the very beginning of this song is this, this intimate desire from this shepherd girl, the Shulamite, for a close relationship with her man. She thought, saw that as better than anything else. It says, for your love is better than wine. <laughs> ah, young love. <laughs> Do you remember it? It's been a long time. And do you remember, do you remember how wonderful and new and fresh the relationship with Christ was when you first turned your life over to him? Do you remember that? Everything was new, everything was fresh, everything was amazing. I think this verse describes that love that we had and should still have with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I want you to notice also the respect that King Solomon had among everyone. It speaks of his name, his name. And, 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 and by the way, when it speaks of his name, it speaks of his character. 
So it speaks of his character as ointment poured forth. Therefore, because of his character, it says the virgins love you. That respect, that character is what caused her to exclaim then, draw me away, draw me away. If you're looking at a, for a husband, look first to his character. And especially, listen carefully, those of you who aren't married but would like to be married, which might be on the video, <laughs> but especially consider what others think of him. Does he have the respect of others? Do others think well of him? Is he a catch or is he a fish to throw back? And sometimes you will know that by the opinion of others. Amen. In this case, the virgins love you. Others love this man, love Solomon. He was well thought of. His name, his character was respected. That's so important. Character outshines beauty. Are you listening? Mm -hmm. Character outshines beauty. And believe me, I know that you know this, but Jesus is the best catch of all. Amen? Amen. Jesus is the best catch of all. Now we hear from the daughters of Jerusalem. We hear from the, the ladies of the court. And they say, we will run after you. These ladies of the court, these daughters of Jerusalem are so interested in this developing relationship that they cry out to the shepherd girl. We want to follow you. We want to hang out with you. We will run after you. And then the Shulamite responds. The king has brought me into his chamber. So she begins to describe her relationship with the king. The king brought this shepherd girl uh, back to his house. In other words, he's beginning to share uh, his life with her. I kind of imagine uh, he introduced her to his mother. I don't think we can see anything more than that in that verse. But what we can also say is that Jesus has brought us into his chambers. Amen? Amen. In fact, we look forward to the day when we will enjoy the mansion in heaven that he has made for us in the Father's house. Until then, even though we were still on we are still here on earth, our future is certain. The Bible says that we are currently seated in heavenly places with Christ. That's how certain our future is. God sees it as a done deal right now. I know you're sitting in these chairs right now in this sanctuary, but your your salvation is so sure that God sees you already seated in heavenly places places with Christ. He has brought you into his chambers. Isn't that amazing? Praise God. Now the daughters of Jerusalem respond, we will be glad and rejoice in you. We will remember your love more than wine. You know, it's good when your friends approve of your boyfriend. And it's not good when they don't. So we see that they approve. We will be glad and rejoice in you. Again, we see that reputation matters. The daughter of Jer daughters of Jerusalem rejoiced. They thought well of this developing romance. In fact, the, the romance between this shepherd girl and Solomon, it was intoxicating. It was an intoxicating romance. They said, we will remember your love more than wine. <laughs> Let me ask you this. Is your love for Jesus intoxicating? Is it intoxicating? Do you swoon at your relationship with Christ? Do you wake up thinking about him? Do you think about him throughout the day? And is he on your mind as you turn in? I think we have a lot to learn about our relationship with Jesus through the Song of Solomon. You can never love Jesus too much. And you can never think about Jesus too much. You can never be too intoxicated with Jesus. Amen? Amen. Our problem is that we don't think about him enough. 
you ever get pulled over for drunk driving, tell them you're intoxicated with Jesus. <laughs> you're all excited. That's why you took your hands off the wheel. You were praising God. <laughs> Now we hear from the Shulamite again. It says, rightly do they love you. And then in verse 5, I am dark, she says, but lovely, O daughters of Jerusalem, like the tents of Kedar, like the curtains of Solomon. Those were dark colored animal skins. And then in verse 6, she says, do not look upon me because I am dark, because the sun has tanned me. My mother's sons were angry with me. They made me the keeper of the vineyards, but my own vineyard I have not kept. So the Shulamite girl speaks now to the daughters of Jerusalem, and she understands there's a reason people look up to Solomon. She says, rightly do they love you. I mean, there's a reason why people look up to you. They can see in you this wonderful character, this wonderful person. Character matters. Again, we see that throughout this book. Character matters. And, and if you're a man, be a man of good character. Be a man that others will think well of and look up to. Be that man. And if you want to be that man, be a man of the Word of God. Amen? Be faithful to God. Be truthful in all your dealings with other people. You know... I can remember getting saved and, and starting to get all excited about Jesus. And there were people that looked down on me because of that, right? Called me a Jesus freak, and I was. But you know what? Those same people, they also looked up. In their time of need, guess what? They came. They wanted to know more about Jesus. And they wanted to know because I stood firm. And I didn't waver, and I didn't give up. You know? And so be a man, be a man or woman, be a man or woman of the word of God and, and people will look up to you. So not only did the Shulamite have a high estimation of her man, right? Rightly do they love you? I mean, she understood she saw in him what they saw. So not only did she have a high estimation of her man, but she had a right estimation of herself. She had a right estimation of herself. That's not to say she had a low estimation of herself, right? No, I'm, look at me, I'm all terrible. She didn't have that. She had a right estimation of herself. She said, I am dark, but lovely. Looks like her stepbrothers, because it says it was her mother's sons. It doesn't say... Uh, she was related to him, but it must have been her stepbrothers. They were angry with her. And so they gave her all of the outside jobs and chores to do. As a result, her skin uh, became dark because the sun had tanned her. She was always out working in the sun. In one sense, she says, do not look upon me because I am dark, because the sun has tanned me. Even in her day, Light-colored skin was prized because it belonged to those of a certain social status who did not have to do manual labor outside. But she wasn't that kind of a girl. She was a working girl. She was a girl of character. So, fellas, anyone listening to our video online... If you're looking for a bride, you need to look further than the outside. You need to look further than the outside. You need to look past the outside. Beauty is only skin deep. And beauty, believe it or not, fades with time. It just does. Time. People that say age is just a number, they just haven't hit the right number yet. <laughs> but they will. One day they'll hit that right number and by, by golly, they'll be old, just like the rest of us. But character is timeless. Character goes to the heart of a person and it lasts a lifetime. But this shepherd girl, 
She wasn't unlovely. In fact, she was a natural beauty. So in spite of being a working girl, she could say, I'm dark, I'm tanned by the sun, but lovely. She also mentions that she, and likely because of the work she was doing, she didn't have time to really take care of herself, to primp and prime. She said, but my own vineyard I have not kept. She didn't have time to fuss over herself because she had work to do, you see. Now she speaks to her beloved. And we're going to see this, that this is going to jump around a little bit. But she speaks to her beloved. She says, tell me, O you whom I love, where you feed your flock, where you make it rest at noon, for why should I be as one who veils herself by the flocks of your companions? And again, if I didn't mention it in the, in the introduction, these scenes, these vignettes, jump around. They're not necessarily in strict chronological order because the story they are telling is not necessarily chronological. It's a song. It's a song. And like a song, the artist puts it together to say what he wants it to say, you see. In this case, our Heavenly Father put this song together using King Solomon to say what he wanted to say in the way he wanted to say it. So now she, the shepherdess, the Shulamite, she speaks to Solomon. And she calls out to him. She wants to know where he is so she can be with him during the day. She wanted to hang out with him. I'll never forget, and I hope my son doesn't watch this tape, or my daughter-in-law. But I'll never forget when my son and my daughter-in-law were dating. And uh, my son was out in the driveway working on his car, right? He's just working on his car. And there she is, leaning on the fender. <laughs> you know, and just, just, she just wanted to be with him, you know. She didn't know anything about cars. She can't help. She don't even know what a wrench looks like. But there she is, leaning on the fender, just, and he's working. He's got his head under the hood, working away. And the Shulamite girl's like that. She wants to be where Solomon is. There's that love relationship between the two of them. You need to have this kind of desire for Jesus. Amen? You need to lean. Lean on the corner of your desk or chair or whatever and lean into Jesus and, and be where Jesus is at. To hang out with Jesus like that with a, just a wonderful love relationship. Even in the middle of the day. See, she wanted to be with him at noon, right? Maybe. Maybe that was lunchtime, right? It's lunchtime for me. Maybe she wanted to go to lunch with him. Uh, tell me where you, you're feeding your flocks at noon so I can be there. So we can share lunch together. You know, I read this stuff and I think, gosh, I have a lot to learn about my relationship with Christ through this song. Amen? We all, we all probably do. We all need to have a greater love relationship with Jesus. Now she also, that is the shepherd girl, she also mentions that she's not a loose girl looking for a one-night stand. Women who veiled themselves were, were loose women and prostitutes in those days. And I suppose they veiled themselves so that no one would know who they really were while they were plying their trade. And we have an example of this in the Bible between Jacob and his daughter-in-law. His son died, and he promised his daughter-in-law to, to a younger son who was growing up. And when he grew up, he didn't give her to him, or, or didn't give him to her. And finally, she played the prostitute with Jacob. She veiled herself, sat at the side of the road. He didn't know who she was. As a result, he was brought to shame because of his actions. But if you veiled yourself, you were a loose woman in those days. The shepherd girl says, For why should I be as one who veils herself by the flocks of your companions? In other words... My love is only for you. It's not going anywhere else. 
Now Solomon replies, the beloved. It says, if you do not know, O fairest among women, follow in the footsteps of the flock and feed your little goats beside the shepherd's tents. I have compared you, my love, to my filly among Pharaoh's chariots. Your cheeks are lovely with ornaments, your neck with chains of gold. So now we hear from the beloved whom we believe to be King Solomon. He responds to the the Shulamite girl and he encourages her to follow in in the footsteps of the flock. If you want to be close to the shepherd, I'm speaking of Jesus here, then follow in the footsteps of the flock. Be where the church is when the church is meeting. And I know I'm speaking to the choir here because you're all here on Wednesday night. But there are those who are not here. But if you want to be close to Jesus, then be where Jesus' people are gathered together. Amen? That's so important. If you want to be close to Jesus, follow in the footsteps of the flock. Where the flock goes, you should go. Amen? Amen. When the flock meets, you should meet. (laughs) That's kind of how that works. And that's what Solomon tells her. Follow, if you want to be with me, follow the flock. Wherever the flock goes, that's where I will be. Next, Solomon has some endearing words for this girl. Even though she was a girl of high character, she was also a girl of great beauty, a natural beauty. In fact, Solomon compared her to my filly among Pharaoh's chariots. In other words, she was quite a specimen. She stood out. Solomon apparently had a mare that was the equal in beauty and confirmation and strength and all to some of the finest stallions that apparently had been imported from Egypt and had been used to pull Pharaoh's chariots because only stallions pulled Pharaoh's chariots or chariots. So she was like a filly among Pharaoh's chariots. Now don't call, go calling your wife a horse. Okay? <laughs> it was a cultural thing in that day. That was a compliment in that day. But today it might not be so much. And even though she was a working class girl, Solomon saw her decked out with lovely ornaments and with chains of gold. That's how he saw her. I mean, she wasn't wearing uh, lovely ornaments and chains of gold. She was a working class girl. She was tanned by the sun. But when Solomon looked at her, that's how she, that's how he saw her. You know, when Jesus looks at you, that's how he sees you. He sees you all decked out. You may be dirty, a little scruffy, not quite so clean, but Jesus sees beauty in you. He sees the beauty in you. He sees the beauty that even you don't see. Amen? Now the daughters of Jerusalem speak again. And they say, we will make you ornaments of gold with studs of silver. So the ladies of the court then They helped this poor shepherd girl out by decking her out with ornaments of gold and studs of silver. So Solomon already saw her looking like that. But the ladies of the court who are also following along because they're so interested in this relationship, they decide they're going to help her out a little bit. And I suppose we could draw the parallel here that we ought to help one another out in the church. Amen? Amen. We ought to be a help to one another. We should serve one another. We should make one another beautiful. I don't mean you put makeup on one another, but <laughs> by serving one another, by helping one another, you see? You beautify the church in that way. Now the Shulamite speaks again in verse 12. While the king is at his table, my spikenard sends forth its fragrance. A bundle of myrrh is my beloved to me that lies all night between my breasts. My beloved is to me a cluster of henna blooms in the vineyards of En Gedi. 
So in this exchange from the shepherd girl, we see that she now prepares herself by perfuming herself before she meets with Solomon. She speaks of spikenard uh, sending forth its fragrance. And she also speaks of having a, a bundle of myrrh around her neck uh, all night that, that reminded her of her beloved. She said, a bundle of myrrh is my beloved to me that lies all night between my breasts. So she had a, a necklace with a, a bundle of myrrh in it, this, this fragrance, and it reminded her of her beloved. Maybe that was a fragrance that he also wore. So she wore it around her neck as a, as a constant reminder of him. Wasn't myrrh one of the embalming spices? It was what the, the wise men brought at Jesus' birth? Isn't that interesting? I like to keep a Bible close to me as a constant reminder of Jesus. Like a bundle of myrrh. Reminds me, I don't want to be far from a Bible. Because I want to die with it in my hands. So I want to be able to reach it when I go. Because it's so precious to me. Because Jesus is so precious to me. And I want you to take note here on a practical level, fellas. Solomon smelled good. <laughs> Amen? On a very practical level, Solomon smelled good. Good. She says, My beloved is to me a cluster of henna blooms in the vineyards of Engedi. I suppose if you're a fella and you're going out on a date, even if it's a date with your wife, you ought to put some cologne on. Amen? And back to our, our illusion. Does the Lord smell good to you? He should. He should be attractive to you, and you should be uh, attracted to him, okay? As henna blooms in the vineyards of En Gedi. En Gedi's a desert. Anybody been to Israel? Been to En Gedi? It's a desert. But where, where the river runs through there, it's amazing. Everything blooms. It's like an oasis all along there. David hid out in the caves of En Gedi. It's an amazing place. A fragrant place near the water. Now look at verse 15. We hear from the beloved. This is Solomon. Behold, you are fair, my love. Behold, you are fair. You have dove's eyes. Not only did Solomon see the beauty of this shepherd girl, but he told her how beautiful she was. He affirmed her beauty. And again, I must mention that beauty is more than skin deep. Some of the most beautiful women in the world are women with a beautiful character. It says this in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 2 and 4, or 2 through 4, it says this. It says, do not let your adornment be merely outward. So don't let it be just putting on the makeup, the perfume, fixing your hair, putting on the, the clothes, right? Don't let it merely be that. Doesn't say don't do that, okay? In fact, I like what J. Vernon McGee once said. He said, you paint your barn, don't you? <laughs> so, so you do take care of it in that way, but don't let it merely be that. Don't let the sum of who you are be skin deep. So do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. So real, enduring beauty is more than skin deep. Every woman can be a real beauty in the sight of God. And believe me, that's the kind of beauty that will be attractive to a real man of God. Amen? Amen. Throughout our marriage, Diane and I, going on 40 years this year, throughout our marriage, I mean almost to a ridiculous extent, 
<laughs> I've told my wife over and over and over again, almost daily, how beautiful she is. I've told her this over and over. I've told her, you are the most beautiful woman in the world. You just are. In my eyes, she is the most beautiful woman in the world. I love that, that secular song, what is it, that says, I only have eyes for you, right? And you know, I believe that. I believe she is the most beautiful woman in the world. And I tell her that regularly. I affirm that regularly. I build her up regularly in that way. Now, going back to Solomon for a minute. He says this. He says, you have dove's eyes. Now, we've got some doves in the neighborhood. You've probably seen them, Eric, right? Doves in our neighborhood, they fly around. Guy down the road feeds them all the time. And I've tried looking into their eyes to see what Solomon saw. I don't see it. Apparently, the kind of doves that lived in that area had good-looking eyes. But what I want to focus on or point out is that Solomon was focused on her face. He was looking into her eyes. Isn't that great? He was looking into her eyes. Now the Shulamite responds to this. She responds back, Behold, you are handsome, my beloved. Yes, pleasant. Also our bed is green. The beams of our house are, are cedar and our rafters of fir. So lastly in this verse, the shepherd girl responds to Solomon. There was this mutual attraction between the two of them. This wasn't one of those arranged marriages. This was a, a draw, a love between two people who found one another, who found beauty in one another, who found respect for one another because they saw the character in one another. She exclaims, "You are! behold, you are handsome. Notice the exclamation point. Yes, pleasant, exclamation point. So not only was Solomon attracted to her, but she was attracted to Solomon. And again, I must mention that beauty is more than skin deep. Solomon was a man of great character at this time in his life. And they also at some point must have had children. Again, I, I mention this because this, this narrative jumps around. It's not necessarily chronological. She says, also our bed is green. So that seems to speak of fertility. And lastly, I want to mention that their relationship was built solidly. It was a solid relationship. It wasn't a passing fancy. She said this, she says, the beams of our houses are cedar and our rafters of fir. Even today, if you're building something and it needs some structural strength to it, the building department is going to require that you use dug fir for that, that, that structural component. So this speaks of the strength of their relationship. The beams of their houses are, are cedar and our rafters of fir. That speaks of the strength of their relationship. They had a strong relationship. Built on a strong foundation, I might add, which is Jesus Christ for us. So if you want to have a strong relationship with your husband or wife, make sure you use the right wood, which is the Word of God. Amen? Build it on a strong foundation, which is Christ, and build it using the solid beams and rafters of the Word of God. That is a house and that is a marriage that will last. Amen? Amen. Wow. What an amazing book. Just reading and studying this book makes me want to draw nearer to Jesus. It makes me want to have a closer love relationship with him. And I hope this book has that same effect on you. And in fact, I encourage you, read ahead. I know some of you have. Read ahead. Read this book. 
see what God would speak to you through this book. And I hope that as a result, you will want to have that kind of love and romantic relationship with the Lord. And I also hope that if you're married, you will learn some lessons through this book on how to love and respect one another in the marriage relationship. Amen? I also hope that you can learn how to be a man or woman who others can look up to and can respect. So as you can see already, there is much to learn from this little book. Amen? Amen. There are incredible, incredible lessons for us here. Anybody remember this song? I'm going to sing it anyway. Then we're going to pray. Then we'll have Damien come up. Anybody remember this song? I'm my beloved and he is mine. His banner over me is love. I'm my beloved and he is mine. His banner over me is love. His banner over me is love. I'm feasting at his banqueting table. His banner over me is love. I'm feasting at his banqueting table. His banner over me is love. I'm feasting at his banqueting table. His banner over me is love. His banner over me is love. His banner over us is love. Amen? Jesus was lifted up on the cross in the air like a banner flopping in the breeze, testifying to his love for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Amen? Amen. Amen. Damien, why don't you come up? Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you and we praise you for your word and for the, the things that you've spoken through this amazing book to our hearts tonight. I pray that we will grow in that love relationship with you that that lord we will come back to if we've left it we will come back to our first love and we pray this in jesus name and all god's people said amen amen amen